And, and those budgets, why in the world would they be building these big mega tunnels and these big, huge bases, you know, thousands of feet under the ground? That doesn't make any sense. That, that, that's not the kind of, you know, expenditure that these huge global corporations want to spend on one another. There's no end in that. There's no, there's no return on the investment there. Quite there's, right. There's something else going on here. They know something they're not telling us. Quite right, and just so. And you know, Dr. Agnew, as I as I hear some of your uh, uh, perspectives and, and uh, experience and the results of some of your research on these things as well, uh, my mind at this moment, I'm trying to keep my attention focused on our conversation of, of now as opposed to where my mind is going thinking about the, well, 10 or 12 programs that we probably have to spend together to, <laughs> to scratch the surface on some of those questions also. But uh, for now, I, I would like to turn our attention in the last segment of the show at 40 minutes after the hour on the Crimson Pill uh, to the article from Space.com dated the 10th of May, 2011. So once again, everything that I've been citing thus far, ladies and gentlemen, falls within the last eight weeks. And that coincidentally falls within Dr. Agnew's uh, mention in the first hour of uh, NASA's internal uh, communications to their employees and and uh, associates and, and whatnot uh, of the last 60 days. And so this piece uh, is entitled, How Rogue Alien Planets Could Host Extraterrestrial Life. This is by Charles Q. Choi, C-H-O-I, Astrobiology Magazine contributor to space.com. It's dated the 10th of May, just a month ago. Uh, interstellar planets, those without stars to orbit, could serve as havens for life, according to a new study. They are often thought to be nearly invisible, since they are much dimmer than stars and do not have any suns nearby to illuminate them. Now, however, research suggests these worlds might be detected by their auroras. Um, it has been speculated, uh, this is a quote from uh, uh, planetary scientist Heike Van Hamaki, and Mr. Von Hamaki, I apologize for annihilating your name just now. It has been speculated that Earth-like rogue planets could have very thick atmosphere that keeps them relatively warm. Or moons of giant rogue planets could experience tidal heating and have oceans beneath their icy surface. Uh, no longer uh, quotation now. Planet hunters have used a variety of methods to detect the indirect effects of extrasolar planets, much as Dr. Agnew described to us before the techniques that they're trying to use to find something that is invisible to us in, in most sense. You have to watch the perturbation. Uh, roll your clocks uh, mentally back to junior high, sitting in the boring science class, and there was always the lovely girl toward the front of the room that we wanted to throw paper wads at. Well, since we were sitting behind her, she could never tell who was throwing unless she tried to tell by the direction that the uh, spit wads or paper wads were landing. That's, that's, that's trying to assess the perturbation that's occurring. Uh, scientists recently suggested that alien worlds around distant stars could also be detected by looking for the radio waves given off by their auroras. Now, I'm going to pause here because, folks, let, let's just hit the title again of the article, the headline, How Rogue Alien Planets Could Host Extraterrestrial Life. And thus far in my conversation with Dr. Agnew, we've discussed how these rogue alien planets are far from rare occurrences Point in fact, the planetoids that are of Jupiter size and larger are at least as numerous as conventional planets, which means that they are numbered in the billions with a B in our Milky Way galaxy alone. It, further from our discussion uh, to this point, we've learned that the planetoids smaller than Jupiter that are in this classification of rogue planets are even more numerous. So folks, we're talking about an incredible number. Uh, uh, the proliferation is, is almost indescribable of these objects. And now, to tie it back, they could host extraterrestrial life. Dr. Agnew, uh, once again, I apologize for, for just kind of uh, rolling and rolling with this, but uh, your thoughts here, too? Well, you know, the real, the real question is, what form is the life in? Is it microbial? Is it a little more advanced? Are we talking about snail darters here, or are we talking about you know, something that, that we would consider to be intelligent or self-aware. Uh, 
and and that's really that's really the question that we we, we want to answer. But odds are, and and I, I'm using this not from a gambling uh, point of view, but from a a quantum probability point of view, mm. that that if we're here, out there is probably from, and I'm just talking about uh, the pure mathematical probability. There's probably another intelligent race. Now we're just we're just barely tapping the uh, the the uh, limits of our own space around our planet. We've sent a couple of probes out, Voyager one and Voyager two, which is, I think, where a lot of this information has come from for this article, and and those were built way back. I mean, they're they're out there at the edge of the heliosphere now sending back information which which literally takes hours to get to us from from where they are. Um and that's just two little tiny pinpricks out there in space where we're getting this information back from. So our like I said our, our sampling is very small. Our extrapolations are bold. But to say that there are tens of millions of free-floating planets out there is certainly legitimate. To say a lot of those planets have atmospheres and are not frozen yet, they still have enough energy left in them to keep themselves liquid and viable, also very legitimate. To say that they're in our general neighborhood, we just cannot say. We can't definitively say, nah, there's not anything in our general neighborhood. We're all by ourselves out here. It's just not legitimate because there isn't enough light coming from them to be able to tell that for sure. That's right. Uh, it, to, to borrow from our earlier analogy, we will not become aware of the presence of the fly until it is spattered on our windshield, perhaps. Perhaps. Um, continuing with this thought, Dr. Agnew, I can imagine that, that quite a number of folks listening are trying to understand if these planets are free-floating through space, particularly through interstellar space, nowhere near to a, to a given star, how could they possibly uh, support life? How could the temperatures, how could the, some of these factors that are essential to life possibly remain consistent enough to actually then support life? And I'd like us to spend the next couple of minutes connecting some of these dots. To do so, I'd like to begin by helping people understand our own atmosphere a bit better, and the electromagnetosphere. Now, folks, we don't have just one atmosphere or one layer thereof. We have the troposphere, which is what we are nearest to, and even when you go to the tallest mountain, you don't get out of our troposphere. We have the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the thermosphere, and the exosphere. These are the five uh, traditionally and most commonly understood layers of our atmosphere. And then we also have the excuse me, electromagnetosphere, which is not a layer of atmosphere. It's quite different. Dr. Agnew, could you describe uh, uh, briefly what the electromagnetosphere is and what it does for us? Well, you know, Earth is one of those planets that, that generates a magnetic field. It comes out of one pole of the Earth and goes into the other pole of the Earth, and those flux lines are unbroken uh, by, uh, by physical theory anyway. And uh, this allows us to, or allows the planet to reroute polar uh, particles and energy uh, fields around the planet to to where we get a polar encroachment on the planet instead of instead of you know coming straight through the atmosphere and hitting hitting the Earth. A small amount will will come through, but most of it gets rerouted around the planet uh, by this magnetic shield. What generates that magnetic field is a matter of controversy. Some say that it's a, a lava engine inside the planet that kind of flows and creates this magnetic field. Others say that there's a solid core inside the Earth and that it's counter-rotating with a metallic crust, and that counter-rotation is a little bit like a big magnetic generator, and that's what makes the magnetic field. Jury's still out as to which one is true. But uh, both of them certainly uh, are, are, are legitimate at this point in time. Uh, one of the statements that you made is perhaps maybe not accurate, and that is that the energy level or the heat level of these planets remains consistent enough to support life. It's not consistent at all. It is decreasing. As long as they are away from a source of energy, like we're close to our sun, those planets are continuously cooling. So the clock is ticking. On Actually... 
Yeah, actually, I need to interrupt, Dr. Agnew, because that uh, that is incorrect. And and let's spend the next moment or two talking about why and how. To do so, I'd like to ask you: the Earth's electromagnetosphere, were it suddenly to drop to nil, it just suddenly stopped. Could you describe to our listening audience what would happen? The the resulting uh, processes. Well, I would say a, a goodly amount of the galactic and solar radiation that's routed around our planet, like from solar flares or, or from uh, you know eminent prominences or or conflagrations from the sun, couldn't be stopped. They would just come straight to the surface of the planet, and and you'd have devastating solar storms. That would it, be the yes. first. It, it, in fact, our five layers of the atmosphere, beginning with the outermost layer, the exosphere, they would they would rather quickly be eroded by the solar wind, by the emissions of charged particles, etc. They would rather quickly be uh, eroded, dispersed, uh, etc. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, they they would be stripped away because there's there's just not enough particles out there to be held gravi- gravitationally into the planet. They are they are kind of held inside of an ionic bubble, which right. is made up by this uh, magnetic field. Quite right, quite right. And I think that our average listener probably still holds the paradigm from seventh grade science class that our sun is like a campfire for us, providing us with heat. That the sun is like a furnace. If the Earth were closer to it, we'd be warmer. If we were farther away, we'd be cooler. But Dr. Agnew, could you tell me what uh, if we were uh, on the space shuttle, and we poked a thermometer out the window, what temperature reading would we receive? Well, it depends on what the thermometer is made of. If it's made of something that would absorb infrared energy, ah. you'd, you'd measure some temperature from the sun. If you're, well if said. you're talking about something that's that's not, you know, on the dark side of the of the shuttle, in the in the shadow of the shuttle, it would be pretty darn close to absolute zero. Yes, very close to absolute zero Kelvin. Uh, uh, on the on the scale of Kelvin, which is extremely cold, I, I'm trying to recollect uh, what that temperature equates to in Fahrenheit, but it's minus well, it's minus 273 degrees Celsius. There you have it. There you have it. And uh, when an object is not directly in the path of the solar radiation, that's a longer subject. We'll come back to that hopefully in the future. Then all the way around the Earth, it is nearly absolute zero Kelvin in temperature. So the sun is not a campfire. It does not send heat in our direction. As Dr. Agnew has pointed out, it is sending radiation. So, folks, the, the, the correct understanding of the mechanic is much more akin to that of a microwave oven. The microwave oven does not generate heat like a conventional oven, a convection oven. Instead, it sends radiation. And whatever your object is that you desire to be heated, it sits in the microwave, and no heat is generated until the radiation comes into contact with the water molecules and, and constituent atoms of that material, if it's a piece of chicken or a cup of coffee. As soon as the radiation encounters that, it excites the molecules, and the friction, that excitation of the molecules, is what generates heat. Uh, it, it, am, I, uh, am I on the right track so far, Dr. Agnew? Yeah, that's the way a microwave oven works. But in infrared, which is a much longer wavelength than, than microwave, uh, it is... Um, it it depends upon what we call the emissivity of the compound that that infrared energy is coming in contact with. In other words, if it comes in contact with a really clean mirror, it's not going to get it hot. But as luck would have it, a lot of people think black is is the color that absorbs the most heat from the sun. It's not. It's green. That's why plants are so smart. They are green, and so thus they absorb infrared energy, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Agnew, I, I've, I've just learned that we're on kind of a bit of a countdown here with our, our remaining available time, and that's, that is so frustrating to me that it's beyond description because we're, we're just reaching the heart of some of the content that I, I thought that we would expand our discussion on uh, quite fully. So my apologies there, but before we leave, I wanted to make sure that we got the opportunity for the listening audience to learn more about your work. Can you tell folks where to go uh, to, to understand more about your work and also perhaps to pick up a copy of Arc of the Millions of Years? Well, the, the easiest place is, you know, X Squared Radio. All the links are there. Uh, you, can, you can always Google uh, for the information. The arcofmillionsofyears.com, uh, 